Hello. Last week I posted the first of a multi-part interview with former Scientologist Tim DeWall. In our first interview, we discussed how Tim got involved in Scientology, and this week we continue to the next stage of his experience, working at the Church of Scientology of Tampa. This and the other interviews I do on this channel are all being done in an effort to provide a more well-rounded look at the subject of Scientology and how it's practiced in the real world versus what you're told or read about in L. Ron Hubbard's books. There's a huge difference between Hubbard's utopian vision of a world free of insanity, criminality, and war, and how Scientology is actually used inside its own organization. I also discuss this in detail in my recently published book, Scientology A to Zenu, An Insider's Guide to What Scientology is Really All About. Tim and his wife Sylvia got out of Scientology just last year after decades of involvement. Let's pick up now with part two of our interview and see what it's like to be a staff member for Scientology. Here's Tim. We had been speaking in our last interview about uh, why you stayed. You know, you did a couple services. They were mediocre results. Right, they weren't great. You know, they were okay, right? And then you had this offer to do, you know, get your services for free, and we're going to get into what that entailed. But I, you had mentioned between here that you'd been thinking a bit more about, you know, what it was that had compelled you to stay in this group despite those results and this promise of clear and, and higher powers and whatnot. Did you want to elaborate on that at all? Definitely, yeah. When, when I went home yesterday or after our little interview, yeah. I, uh, I couldn't figure it out why I stayed. I mean, I remember after the communications course feeling lighter, feeling like I had a little more command on communication, but it wasn't like a big huge thing and even after my processing with the um, HQS course the Hubbard Qualified Scientologist course which you do quite a bit of processing on called objectives yeah to help you yeah. get into present time I remember a couple of good sized wins but usually just being really bored walking between walls <laughs> right it's to very the boring yes. ad infinitum of why am I doing this yes it's really What's the weight? What's the color of the ball? All this crap. <laughs> right. But I was kind of convinced or really realized or thought I knew what I, they were talking about that I had to go through this to get to clear. But during this time, I was not necessarily being a good boy. I still have been promiscuous. I was stopped smoking dope if I was going to go to course uh, okay. 48 hours. Yeah. And I had stopped drinking quite a bit because they were concerned about my drinking. Okay. But I remember immediately after the, uh, I mean, the day after, I think I graduated on a Friday and Saturday night I had drank almost a half a fifth of peppermint schnapps by myself. <laughs> wow. So I was pretty loaded. <laughs> right. And I remember telling, you know, my friend who was, who was a couple of my friends about Scientology a little bit. They didn't want to really want to talk about it. But I just remember I was still kind of in that mindset of, well, you know, I could do the clear thing, but I'm just still partying. But what I, what I realized was I could do whatever I really, really wanted as long as I went back there and gave them money and told them that I was sorry for what I did. They always accepted me. I see. I see. It was really and, weird. And actually, let's talk about that for a second. What about that acceptance thing like here was this group of people they weren't you know you had been raised under a protestant minister yes right and i imagine that maybe there was some lack of acceptance of you know quote unquote immoral activity oh yeah that right? was that was um if my dad truly or mom truly knew my actions mm -hmm. oh yeah no yeah. that would not Definitely have gone not acceptance there. no no way shape or form so here you had this group of people who were, you know, bright and cheery and, you know, clear, you know, it's going to be this clear thing and, you know, all these powers and whatnot, but they were also accepting of you. It didn't really matter who I was, how I said it. The only time that I ever really got in trouble there uh -huh. is if I was rough on a supervisor or if I was, let's say reluctant to give money there'd be some pressure from the registrar from the 
as far up as the, the each organization has what's called a flag banking officer. Oh, an FBO, okay. uh-huh. and sometimes they would come in and check on the regs for some I don't know why. Okay, but there would be a little flack from the finance people or ethics. But other than that, Division Six treated me like I was, no matter what I did. Okay, and they knew that I was being at ethics. They knew that I was being. <laughs> From their viewpoint, right. I had two girlfriends, I was getting drunk, I was still getting high. Oh, okay. They knew it. And, and so they label that out ethics, meaning uh, not exactly towing the line or following the rules. Per them. Right. Or not surviving as well as I should as an individual. There you go. That was the whole goal of it. They were like trying to go, well, because I kept getting all these bridge analogies or I would get these sit downs. There was always a pamphlet handed to me or I was really urged to read the basic books. Um, and well, I didn't want to read the books. I wanted to be clear. Right. So I thought, well, what the hell? I can do all of this stuff. Every time I come back, I don't really get in trouble with these people. I go talk to this ethics guy for about 20 or 15 minutes and then, and then I get sent back to the course room. Right. I get told not to do something again. And other than that, I'm like, well, I started to get the idea I could do what I wanted to do. Okay, there we go. I really did. I kind of got that flow. Right. Okay. Good. And yet you could still be part of this group of shiny, happy people. Oh, yeah. As long as I was paying the money. Right. <laughs> right. It really was. I mean, I never got out of that organization on a daily basis in St. Louis without either being asked to buy a book, all of my books, several more courses, and processing. That was daily. Okay. If not twice a day, right. like at break and when I would leave. Okay, tracking on that. Okay, good. So um, good. So that helps clarify a little bit as to why you know why stick around. Yeah. Yeah. So then you moved down to Clearwater. You moved down to, to Florida. Yes, I did. Okay. So then you're in Tampa. This woman sits you down and says, "How would you like to get your services for free?" Right. Yeah. They so, had. They had honored, I wasn't, I wasn't quite had everything done on the HQS and there was a couple little things I had to do. They honored that, yep. which I think I was in the course room two hours and I was done. Okay. At the end of that, I went to the examination, passed all that stuff, and they sit me down in front of this woman named Roberta Washburn, who was, became a friend of mine, and her husband was the course supervisor, Richard Washburn, and she goes... How would you like to get all of your auditing and all of your training for free? And I'm like, you got you to gotta get the idea. I got long hair. I got a hatchet <laughs> here. Like a little hatchet would hang out. Wow. Different colored hair in the back. I was a partier, you know. So they're like, I'm like, I think I referred to as I said, you know, that would really stone me. <laughs> Because I still was kind of like a wild, a little bit of a wild man. I wore a vest, and they were actually trying to get me to stop dressing like that. I see. So I said, okay, sure, yeah, what do I got to do? So she hands me a staff contract, and I'm like, well, what do I got to do with this? She says, well, you sign it. It's either two and a half years or five years, uh-huh. and you get to either... I can't remember, you get 12 and a half hours of either processing and you go in training every day and that's like a week or something that you get that. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, really, I don't have to do this for two and a half years and I can be clear? And she says, yeah, probably within a couple of years you'll be clear because you'll get processing every day or you'll get processing all the time. So I'm like, well, what do I have to do to get processing? Well, you have to finish these basic courses and then get your job. You have to get posted for a particular what they call a hat or a job in an organization. And I'm like, well, that seems pretty easy. So I signed a contract. I didn't even read it. I just signed that bitch. Right. right. I ne- matter of fact, I never signed anything. I never read any of the shit that I ever... Really? Read. In all the years? Not much. No. That's very little telling. bit, A little that's, bit. A little bit of here and there. Yeah. And I noticed they got bigger and bigger as I got other people to sign them throughout the years. But I didn't really read it. I didn't read the staff contract real close at all. Interesting. I just signed it. So you weren't aware of the fact that you were basically signing away all your rights to everything. No, I had no idea. rights to everything. I just wanted to be clear. I wanted to be clear and I wanted to be in, 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 in this particular group because, again, 
I really had a group that didn't really judge me. Mm -hmm. And if they did judge me, it was from a point of view of correction. And I was at that point convinced that I needed correction. I needed to have survival. This group had gotten me to that point. I can't say that I'm not fully responsible for accepting that viewpoint, but that viewpoint came at me from day one when I walked in that you have a ruin or a situation that needs to be handled and we're the only group that can do it. Very definitely. Very that's definitely. what I got. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And that's exactly how they, you know, get their hooks in somebody. Yeah. So so you joined staff. Yes. And now you're working at Tampa. What was the first uh, post or job that you had? Well, the first thing that they made me or had me do was um, I was what's called an expediter. Okay. And um, I would work in the central files. Okay. And I was back there with some people. I don't even know if they knew the, the freaking alphabet. Okay. And central files being like what's a one well, sentence central files, of that? Central files was the area where if a, purchase, if a person purchased a book or a service... They got a manila folder, they got their name in there with their address, what they'd done, and a little bit of information, any letters that might have been written back and forth from them to them or from them to the organization would then be filed in there to keep track of that person. So you could send them more information about the church. So I was there and it was it was a it was a shambles. Really? Broken oh, broken file cabinets, misspelled names, um, Instead of like AA, it might go AC. If the person had a second letter, then A, it was a mess. Okay. So I was there for hours and on ends cleaning that crap up. Okay. That's what I did. And how long did that go on for? Weeks. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. And were you working full time in the organization? Oh, yeah. Uh, pretty much 40 hours a week. Yeah. My first paycheck was $4.49. And what did you think about that? I immediately got a job that day okay so that then day you started when working I, a different job i said yeah i said guys i'm not gonna stand i can't do this and and not make any money because i have to have a place to live right and what it was there like was there any sort of like standard response to that or they were just like their solution was you can go live at the staff house they owned a house and they said yeah you can go live there for 20 dollars a week 80 80 to 100 dollars a month and I said, okay, but I'm still going to go get a job. And they said, well, if you get a job, you know, you can't work here as much. And I'm like, yeah, but I can eat food. <laughs> I can drive my car. Right. And I can sleep somewhere. Right. Because I can't keep traveling back and forth. I was still living at, you know, living at different locations around and I couldn't afford that. Right. So I went and I got a job for like 30 hours a week, and the rest of the time, I would work at the organization. Which is exactly what I did. Yeah. My first year in Santa Barbara, I struggled and struggled, and it was only because my parents were supporting me yeah. that I was able to, you know, be full-time at the, at the church, and then, then it was just enough, and I had to go get another job. Barely enough, yeah. yeah. Okay, so, uh, so you're an expediter, then you get another job, and then you're still working at the church, Right. And so was there any time for any of this free service that they was promising to you? Very little in the beginning. Hardly any at all. It was all about um, finishing what they called statuses or staff statuses. Oh, uh, okay. Um, there's a staff status zero, staff status one, and staff status two. Okay. Zero was almost like you can almost instantly get it. It was like sort of an introduction to where the, things were in the organization. Sure. Staff status one was a little more meaty where you got into how the organization worked a little bit, the lines and, and who you would link up with. And then, yeah, yeah. and then staff status two was much broader and got into quite a bit of um, um, organizational policy and how the overall divisions of the organization worked. And then... Uh, I was given the I was given a, a later job because I I, I finished the, all all of that stuff and I became the bookstore officer. Okay, so now you're in charge of the bookstore in the organization. Right. Yeah, I'd finished all that stuff yeah. and I was posted as what they called the bookstore officer. And how long were you the bookstore officer? Mm, 
about four years. Wow. Okay. Three and a half, four years. So then, and when you signed up for staff initially, you did a two and a half year contract? Yeah, I resigned. So you had to sign another one? Yeah, because I wanted to be clear. Okay. So in that, so let's just say, let's look at that four years as an overall period first. Let's just sure. take a look at that. Did you make any bridge progress? Did you get any of the free services to clear during that four years? Mm. I was, I got auditing to a certain degree, uh -huh. um, and I got training for my particular post or a post within the organization. Nothing that would be training like an individual would pay for. Right. Not one iota. It would always be about studying for the next thing for my job or studying how to be a better staff member. Mm -hmm. And my auditing was very low level. It was um, a lot of what they call correction of earlier auditing or I was the pre-clear for somebody because I'm the new guinea pig, right. haven't had much auditing. So, so students would use students you for would student use me auditing. As a, yeah, which, which led to big problems down the road. I will tell you, I have 30 PC folders and didn't go clear. Got it. Okay, so, so this whole picture does not, like, after everything that you've done, you never went clear. No, sir. Okay, got it. Yeah, right. I, 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 I don't like that, by I, the way. <laughs> I, I totally understand. Yeah. I can tell you, I've had almost this, this every... The story doesn't yeah. have a happy ending. <laughs> no. Okay. But I'll, I'll explain it. Yeah, we'll go through that. So, so you spent four years as the bookstore officer, and, you, and you're... About you're, three and a half to four, yes. Three and a half to four, fine. And um, so you're doing a lot of job training work, you know, study... Um, to be a bookstore officer, like policies regarding being a bookstore officer, how to sell things, that kind of stuff. Yep. A lot of indoctrination on that. What a lot was... of trying to understand how the organization worked. Okay. And what would you? What was your day to day like as a bookstore officer? Well, my day to day was get up about six thirty in the morning. I'd have to be at my regular job around eight o'clock. Okay. I worked on a. I worked on a shipping dock and I was what they called a merchandise handler. So I had a very laborious job. I was unloading trucks, moving large crates, moving clothing to a, a department store. And I would work there until about 1 or 3 in the afternoon. I'd go home, eat, or I'd go directly from there to the Tampa work. Okay. So by 4 or 5, I would be either in the course room or in the bookstore. All right. And that was until what time did you work? 11, 12, depending on... I don't think I ever... Once I really became the bookstore officer and became a, a full-fledged staff member with my statuses in and thought of as, you know, I'm in the group. Um, yeah, 11. Usually 11, 11.30. I never really got out of there well before then. All right. That'd be like Monday through Friday and then the weekends... I didn't work my job. I would just go to the org at like either 10 in the morning or 1 in the morning. It depended on when there was a staff muster. One, and then you one, in, one in the morning or one in the afternoon? One in the afternoon. Okay, got it. And then you would go till about 7 that night or 6.30. All right. Both days? Oh, yeah. Okay. So days off were sort of a yeah, there was, thing of the past. There's a concept called day and foundation. <laughs> right. That concept right. does not exist in small and failing organizations, which right. a lot of these organizations, they aren't what they say. There isn't the amount of expansion that is being briefed to the public because right. you wouldn't want to tell them you're not. So you work constantly. There is no, I'm Tampa Foundation or I'm Tampa Day. No, you're just a staff member right. at right. the Tampa Org. Okay, got it. Yeah, it was the same in Santa Barbara. It's yeah. the same. It's a lot everywhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay, so so you're working seven days a week. Yes. And you're doing this bookstore thing. So then what kind of, um, like, did you get, how was the pressure on you to sell? How did that, how Constant. was that manifested? Daily. But, and where did that come from, and what did you do? There was two posts in the organization. One was called the... DFBO for more. Okay, complicated uh, title. Very long title just means they were really sad over the book materials. Really pushed the materials 
out to the Tampa public and to the Tampa people outside the organization. Okay. Really a big push on books. All right. And, she, and by she, the way, that DFBO for more was the Deputy Finance Banking Officer for the Marketing of Org Resources and Exchange. Wow. Okay. Just so I remember. Has it I clear. remember that. That's right. But uh, you had to. I had to recall that. Yeah. That's right. She was in my ass quite a bit about <laughs> okay. book sales. Yes. And then I had above her. Just to tell you how the organization's a little bit dysfunctional. Yeah. I would get direct calls from someone I think you know named Jeannie Frankel. Oh, yeah. I remember her. I became friends with Jeannie. Okay. And where was she calling you from? Los Angeles, from Bridge. Okay, from Bridge Publications. Yes, the people who produced the books. Right. And she would also call me okay. daily. Now, so she's calling you from L.A., yes. pressuring you to sell books. And I have a boss pressuring me to sell books. And you have the DFBO pressuring you to sell books. Right. Now, the DFBO, now not to get too heavy on structure... But the DFBO is not actually your senior. No, in, but in a small org, as you know, and I'm sure that you've been told this term called Hey You. Yes, the Hey You org board. Yeah, we hey were you. very much a Hey You organization. Right. So our FBO, who was above the DFBO, yeah. was actually our registrar. Oh, wow. You want to talk about cross... Yeah, totally cross. Hats. Okay, okay. So so you didn't have a direct senior as a... Like, like, your, like according to the titles on the organize, organizing board, your senior would have been what was called the dissemination secretary. We didn't have one of those. Okay. Did you have the next person up would have been the HCO executive secretary? Very seldom did the HCO executive secretary have anything to do with books at our place. Got it. Okay, but nor was that post completely filled all the time. Good. Okay, so there either wasn't somebody there, or the person who was there barely had time for you. About ninety percent of the time, there okay. was nobody there. There was somebody who would be posted maybe here and there, or what was called covering that post. But it was what you would refer to as, or what. Hubbard referred to as a camouflaged hole. Got it. Okay, so there's just no nobody really there. Mm, and the next no. level up is the executive director, the person who's running the whole show. Right. And so your senior really would tend to be the this this hole of, of a person who was sometimes there, or the executive director, the guy who's running the whole program. So the only, these people are kind of ignoring you. Yeah, the only time the executive director ever came into the bookstore is if they needed something from the bookstore. I never really had <laughs> a direct line to that senior other than you become friends with these people or you know them or you say hi or you every Thursday night you go to the staff meeting and they ask you because they're the most direct line, uh, what was your stat? Right. Meaning your statistics. Yeah, what was your statistics? Your How production. many books did you sell? Right. How many meters did you sell? So this is really interesting only because it really shows the, you know, it was exactly the same in Santa Barbara where I was coming up for eight years. And the point being that, you know, this is what it's like for real in a church of Scientology. Is Absolutely. These holes and these like cross lines of people running each other who really have no business running each other. And there's this beautiful chart on a wall that shows what it's supposed to look like. But really, it's just a bunch of people running around telling each other what to do. Oh, yeah. And trying the, and trying to comply to orders that they're receiving, like from a phone call from L.A. You're getting called from this woman you've never met. Oh, yeah. From the, from, from the organization that makes the books. Yes. So what were those phone calls like and what kind of pressure were you getting? At first, um, the first one was she was on the phone with, I guess, who would have been the deputy for more, the DFBO. Yeah. And, and I was then handed the phone. I'm like, this person gets on the phone and she tells me I have to do all this and all that and all this. And I'm like, yeah, whatever, bitch. I don't really give a shit. <laughs> yeah, right. You know I, I didn't really have is. a whole lot of respect. Now, now, at this point, did you have... Now, was... Now, Jeannie was a Sea Org member. 
She was a member of the Sea Organization working at Bridge. Yeah, I, I didn't really have too much understanding of what that was. We were, right. uh, I remember seeing some guys in uniform in Clearwater. Yep. And every now and again, I'd see somebody in uniform at the, the, uh, at the Tampa Org. And I'm pretty new. I'm only in like three or four months. And I don't know what these people do. I could give a shit. I'm in this room with a bunch of books and a telephone and a list of names. And my job is to make sure every person gets what's called a full library. That was my, that's what I was told to do. All right. So you were basically doing cold calling to get, to call the, well, not totally cold calling, but you're calling people you haven't met before. I mean, these customers. No, these or I would drag them out of the course room at break. Okay. And trying to convince them to buy a complete library of L. Ron Hubbard materials, all the books and all the lectures. Oh yeah, that, that was were like available. a big, huge thing. Not just buy one or two books; you have to buy all of the books. Right. Okay. I was I was told that by Jeannie Frankel all the time. Jeannie was a really when, once she and I had a rapport, and I I apologize for calling her like a bitch for because she starts yelling at me. I don't know her. I'm like, whatever. She, fuck. I said something like, go fuck yourself, bitch, or something like that, and I just hung the phone up. And the DFBO from more, she goes like, her eyes are like this big. And she goes, do you know what you just did? I said, yeah, I hung up the phone because this bitch is crazy. <laughs> that is just the most awesome thing ever. So, because it was a completely appropriate response. I just, she started yelling. I, I don't know her. She's like, I guess I wasn't giving her the right answers. I wasn't like being respectful, but I'm like, I don't know who the fuck you are. Right, right. <laughs> So what? So how did you guys end up mending those fences? What what happened? Uh, she called me back uh, that night and said, "Look, you know, this is kind of how it works. And I know you know from studying this, and because really on the staff status is you clear up what C org officers are and all that stuff, but you don't really. There isn't like a whole bunch of maybe outside of one reference about how to treat C org members." Mm -hmm. You don't real. You're not rubbing elbows with them when you're in a class. When you're in that. When you're in a small organization. Like right. That. What's called a class five. A organization. class five organization. Yeah. You just don't. Right. So I'm like, I don't know these people. Right. And I get handed the phone, and this woman's yelling at me. Right. I'm like, no, nope, this ain't gonna work. Right. But she calls me back. They they the DFBO more talks to her a little bit. We get into a conversation. She says, look, we have to sell these books. That's your job. You know. Again, reiterating that I'll get processing and auditing and all that stuff. Jeannie, oh, okay. was, Jeannie was pushing that and, and that how I could help clear Tampa. Like, make, make everyone in Tampa, every man, woman, and child clear by the... Because the, the line that kept being hammered at me, and I'm sure you'll understand this line, is called books make booms. Yes. Meaning you get books out there and the person's... Who read the books are so much easier to then get money from and they'll flow more onto the bridge because they understand they have a deeper understanding of dynamics and Scientology that was constantly hammered at me so for four years you were hearing this mantra about books make booms and complete your library and totally. get these books into public hands totally yeah I, yeah I excelled at that post I didn't really follow a lot of the training I just went after people because, two, you get a 15% cent, 15 commission for all book sales above and beyond your staff salary. Right. See, that doesn't exist now. Right. And I got a but 5%. Time, yeah. yeah. And I got a 5% commission on meters. Okay. So I was referred to after a while as Chainsaw D Wall. Really? I was actually given a chainsaw at one year of being the bookstore officer. A baby little toy chainsaw that I hung that I actually set on a shelf and uh, they because I would take people in the bookstore and I would hammer them until they bought as much shit as I could sell them interesting interesting and because and was this primarily because of the commissions you were gonna get it was because of the money because I wanted to eat and I was feeding one of my friends who was an auditor who had a full-time job there and he was he worked in the tech division and had no way of getting a job. He wasn't going to get a job, so oh, wow. I was trading the food. Somebody else. I was trading the food and the time to set up my auditing. Oh, and he was going to audit you. Yeah. And we on our off time. And he was. Interesting. 
So you had to actually, I did not know that. So you had to go make all these special arrangements. To oh get yeah. The auditing you were supposed to get. Yeah, when you have when you have 20 some staff and you have two auditors, that 12 and a half hours you're told you're going to get, that's not true. Right. You can't that that Right. That that doesn't even add up mathematically if you think about it before you sign that com- that contract. Right. If you go if you know anything about the organization, there's no way that they're going to service the public and service you. Right. But they conveniently Failed to mention any of that. Yeah, that's usually pretty much failed. Right. Yeah. All right. So, um, so you, good. So you did this for four years. You made a little bit of auditing progress, but not really any bridge. Not progress. a whole lot. No, not a whole lot. I, I, I made. You know, I had to redo what I had done on the, uh, the objectives again. So again. I did them twice, <laughs> which that's like that's several hundred hours. It seemed like. Between the two times, it was hundreds of hours of processing, so I had to redo those. And this wasn't even for money. This was just them. Sort no, they of were them doing you it. This, you just had to do this it. This was my buddy who was doing it that I was helping feed. Right. And he was making you redo all this stuff because you didn't get it right the first time. Yeah, my folders had gone over to the Mecca and got all fixed up, and uh, which they the org paid for because I had excelled at my post. But they didn't. I guess they just probably traded for this time. They came back and they had corrected all of the student auditing and then put me back on what's called the objectives or what I had done all the way back in St. Louis. Got it. You had to redo it. All of that. Okay. So basically that's what happened in the first two and a half years was cleaning all that mess up and doing the objectives, getting to a point then where I was supposedly stable. Okay. All right. Uh, and what, how did, just as a question, how did that manifest in your life? Did you feel any different or did it act any different? Was your life you know, any better? I, I was busy. Um, so, again, it was the whole idea. I'm in camaraderie with the group. I have to get through this. Somebody's telling me I have to do this again. So if I get through all this book and bottle and walk back and forth the walls and all this shit, I can go clear. I just, you got to... For me, it was all about when I'm clear. The 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 world of worlds, the best of best. I will no longer have a reactive mind. I won't be angry at people. I won't be thinking about like looking down women's tops when I'm trying to sell them books. I won't. You know, I'll have all this this uh, utopia of uh, euphoric belief. You know that I'm like great, and I'll be able to have idyllic memory and I mean I knew what the definition was I used to read it all the time in the the, the red dictionary I see because I wanted of a clear it. right I wanted that okay that's so, what drove me I well I was I was wondering if you had read Dianetics at this point no okay but I hadn't you... read any of the books but I was selling them <laughs> I didn't give a, people would ask me what have you read I'm like no I don't know what's in it just you need to buy it because it's it's part of your library where are you out in your library and we would keep sheets on people. Right. Like where they were. You saw those sheets. Oh, yeah. And you would, oh, you don't have problems with work. Well, my cousin's brother, sister has a copy and I borrowed it. No, you can't borrow the books because everyone has to have their own books <laughs> and two meters. Right. That's right. I remember saying that probably a million times. Right. And just pushing, pushing, pushing that. That was your function. Yeah, people got nervous when they were around because I just didn't stop. Because I thought the more of these that I would sell, I could put the money away, you know. And I was buying meals for myself and for my and for my best friend on staff. Right, got it. Okay, so, um, but but you're under. But it's so funny because your understanding of clear and what it was that you wanted was sort of this, you know, sort of imaginary thing based on some definitions you read in the dictionary. Yes. It wasn't anything besides folklore. It wasn't anything besides um, at the end of each week, if somebody did go clear, which nobody did. <laughs> right. Sorry. Like few and far between. Few and yeah, far between. Yeah. They would send them over from flag and they would give like little speeches. Yeah. And I'd always pull them away afterwards and, and there'd always be this glorified viewpoint of what I'm going to be and how I can't know what the next thing is. Right, right. Okay, tracking on that. So 
how did the bookstore because you stayed on staff past the bookstore thing so what how did yeah, you I was on staff from... total almost nine years okay so after the bookstore officer like how did that change how did you move from chainsaw... that's a funny story <laughs> that's a funny story to wall too. the um the chainsaw got removed by the watchdog committee by the way somebody <laughs> somebody came in and way up in nosebleed territory and liked me but said you got to take that out of here that's not part of the decor Interesting. so that was funny they took that out but okay. no they uh another mission came in and a mission is when they bring a group of sea org people in to fix a particular portion or part or something that's wrong in the organization yes so i said they said hey how would you like to still sell be able to sell books hold that job of bookstore officer until we find a new person it should only take a couple of weeks it took six months um and do a very valuable job that this organization needs and i'm like what is that you can be the flag representative for tampa org and i'm wow. like and i'm like i said doesn't isn't that supposed to be a sea org member yes and they said yes and i said well you know, I've done LSD. I don't qualify to be a Sea Org member. And they said, well, no, we have a program here where we're getting the, um, I don't want to use too many terms, LRH communication, you know, the, the, the flag rep at, at the flag level uh -huh. basically is going to be your direct senior. She's going to wear the Sea Org hat, and all you're going to do is run every program yep. including the ed's program the org program number one all of these programs they're going to be under you you're right. going to push it so okay good so just as a minor bit of explanation yep. here in scientology programs are a series of steps that get done in order to accomplish a particular target or a particular milestone for yes. the organization right like let's say you could have a program to um enhance the entire uh front area of the organization and man it up with new staff so that the organization is all set up to get a bunch of new people in and that could be your public area expansion program you could call it that yes and i'm just making this up but this would be an example of a kind of program that would run in an organization. Oh yeah. And somebody has to be in charge at the level of the organization on the ground to get the staff to do the steps of that program. Otherwise it's just a piece of paper with a bunch of writing on it. Somebody has to actually do it. And the job of the flag rep is to get those programs that come down from management, like the one I just said, mm -hmm. and, and contact the staff members personally and get them to do their steps or their part to do that program. Yes. With the end result being that the organization would be bigger and better as a result of doing that program. That's the theory of how it's supposed to run. Yeah, it was maddening. Exactly. Now tell me why it was maddening. Well, one, I never, I didn't really get anyone to take over being the bookstore officer for months on end. Right. And when it was, this person was just not as vicious or as desirable to do what they were supposed to do to get the books sold. Yes. So I then had Roberta, Jeannie Frankel, the ED, pushing me on books. And then I had a separate communication line into the bookstore on my desk, the Sea Org calling me. Got it. To get these programs done. Oh, and they were... Do you want to talk about vicious? Or Please. do you want to talk about harsh? Give an example. This, I, I never, ever had a nice conversation with this... I think she was... She was East U.S. LRH Communication or something like that. She ran those programs from Eastern United States... Continental Liaison Organization okay. directly to me on a telephone. Wow. Okay. And, and of they course, that telexes. is also completely contrary to yes. what the directives of Hubbard say to do because right in, he says not to use phones. Right. 
you were supposed to be getting telexes. I got both. I got telexes, and then I would get follow-ups, and I would had a what was called a uh, a program board. Uh huh. Uh-huh. And basically, it con- consisted of I never put them up on the board because I couldn't do all that writing. So I would just put them on a <laughs> clipboard, and I had ev- I had a copy of everybody's program. Right. And you were supposed to run around, make personal contact with them, and get them to do their individual steps or targets on the program. Yeah. And in addition to this, you were supposed to still be the bookstore officer. Yeah, and each one of those people, if you you want to get even more insane, each one of those people I contacted were what were called book outlets of an organization. (laughs) So they're also supposed to be selling books. So... I was always trying to kill two birds with one stone because I still had to have my statistics up for the bookstore. So I would pound on them about their program target and selling books. Okay, got it. So this became a whole new drill for you. Yeah, I I put what was called foot on the carpet at that time. Foot on the carpet? I called it foot on a carpet. Basically, if they were involved in a book deal and I had to help them, and my and I would and I was anywhere near my foot was on the carpet. I got half the commission. I see. Okay. That's not written in any LRH policy that I'm aware of. <laughs> no, it's not. Yeah. Foot on the carpet. That's why I've never heard that. Before. Right. And then there was on top of that weekly there was the form that filled out how many you would have to inventory the books, and you were supposed to go back and count each book. That's right. Yeah. Book G- inventories. Yeah, Gene, Gene Frankel would get the same report every week because I would just fill it out and send it. Right. And she caught on and said, I seem to get the same report each week. Yes. And in the meantime, I was also trading books with other bookstore officers, including Flag Land Base. Mm-hmm. For Illegally. Stock, stock you didn't have. Right. You'd trade Selling. for stock they had. While I was supposed to be filling out this form. Right. Right. Yeah, I didn't. Yeah. yeah. And I was doing the flag rep. It it was completely insane. It was yes. it was insane. Right. It was the most insane that I think I've ever felt in my life other than taking the ED post, which we'll, we'll talk we'll, about. We'll talk that. about, yes. So, okay, how long did this flag rep double hat thing go on for? About mm, one year. Wow. Okay. Yeah. You're getting phone calls. Now, the East U.S. Management is located in New York, so you've got a Sea Org unit or an organization up there of Sea Org members who are based out of New York, yes. who are managing all of the eastern United States orgs, right, like Tampa, yep. and uh, they're not managing FLAG, FLAG's its own thing, the, the big, right. huge org in Clearwater, but they're managing Cincinnati and Boston and New York and Tampa and oh yeah you know all these places right yep and everything east of the Mississippi River basically yeah they they so, it so was... you're getting phone calls from these guys directly yes, yes. to my desk wow telling you what to do and, yeah and... telling me telling me that I had to get these programs done that they were more important than the books but I also still had to get the books sold right right. So everybody's, in the meantime, you're getting pressure to get the books sold because books are, make booms. Right. And so you've got this double trouble coming well, at you on your head mm-hmm. for a year. Oh, yeah, maybe a little longer. Right. And welcome to staff member Scientology. Yeah, it was insane. Yeah. So then, um, now, you had been in staff now, let's say, let's talk, let's talk about this for a minute. Uh, for about four or five years now. About right? four and a half, almost four years, seven months, something like that. Okay, around eight by the months. time we come to the end of this flight. Yeah, I was thing. pretty seasoned by the time that I knew I was I knew that I had some clout. I was running around, people knew me as the bookstore officer, but they also knew me as the flag rep. I was I was definitely telling some people well well above my pay grade what to do. Right. Because as the flag rep that's that job is the is the equivalent to or at the same level as the executive director. Yeah, I was I would so, I was having quite a few meetings with the executive director, and I was I was definitely bringing some of that heat through the phone to that person. Right. And since they were kind of at the same level, they would bring heat back to me. Right. It was kind of argumentative. Most of my back and forth. I'll bet. Yeah. I'll bet. Well. So. Then, 
what was the result in terms of the size of the organization and the success of the organization after being a bookstore officer, you know, pushing to complete everybody's library, then getting these programs and running those for about a year, was the situation improving at all? No. It wasn't? No. No. Um, Tampa was always sort of a, I wouldn't call it small and failing, Mm -hmm. because we had sort of a pipeline from the Mecca. The Mecca was fairly picky about the folks they took in. Okay, and you were right down the road from the Mecca. From uh, Yeah, so we would receive mostly HCO ethics particles who were basically not qualified to be at Flag Land Base, but could be at our level of the organization and had money. Okay, and by HCO ethics particles, now HCO is the Hubbard Communications Office, right. Division 1 yes. of an organization. Yes, they are. And that is where the ethics officers that, we're, that we love to talk about so much, that's where the ethics officers reside, is in yeah. Division 1. Yeah. And so when a person is doing things that the church considers objectionable in their life like you know breaking the law or doing you know things that they shouldn't be doing or looking on the internet at Scientology stuff and this kind of thing then they end up in front of an ethics officer right right? now flag the Mecca the big you know place in Clearwater has certain requirements in order for people to show up there and do services absolutely and like for example you can't have uh, you know, tried to commit suicide in your life, like pretty much ever. We had a few right? of those. Yeah. So if you show up to Flag and they say, have you ever tried to commit suicide? And you go, well, yeah. And they go, okay, well, there's the door and don't let it hit you on the way out. Yes. And they would then say, well, that's not a requirement at Tampa. So you go do services down at Tampa. And they would send you there because they send the person there because Tampa was the closest place they could send them. That was the biggest organization near Flag. Yes, and yes. that was your place. So we would get quite a bit of those type folks. Yeah. We didn't have very many. Um, what you try to do is you get a new a new person in, get them to do a basic course, and then make them what's called a major. Okay. I'm sure you're familiar with this oh, term. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Major was very important. A right. major was taking somebody from a brand new course onto a higher level course, onto a course more meaty, more getting them to understand, more committed to Scientology. Right. And there were, that was sort of a dead, flat, zero, one, maybe two throughout, and you would maybe get truly maybe five or six of those people a year that would hold on to being a major. And that is probably That's, one of the most key and telling statistics of uh, the actual expansion of Scientology. Yes. Because we're talking about converting a person over, basically from being a new person, an introductory person, doing low-level services, to what they call the major services, or somebody who's really a Scientologist now. They've oh, crossed yeah. the bridge over, they've, they've taken, you know, they've drunk the Kool-Aid, they're in, they're on board... They're in Division 4 now. They've gone from Div 6, Public Division, to Division 4, which is the major services. Right. And so, you're, so your organization is producing five or six of these a year? Maybe. Right. Yeah, so, it's, not, it's not a huge organization. I would say when I was being both the bookstore officer and the representative, the flag representative, I think think we had a consistently 20 to 22 to maybe 35 people a week that we were servicing what you call biz or bodies in the shop right that's an important statistic as well how many customers are being serviced that week now that didn't necessarily get your walk-in people of maybe 10 to 12 a week and maybe one to two start a service right right a lot of them don't even make it through the test so the first introductory film and they go out the door or right. they say no and they don't count as bodies in the shop unless they've paid for the service correct right you go yes. in and do a personality test that's not a body in the shop yep 
All right. So so this is going on, and the organization is not getting any bigger despite all no. this work. <laughs> no, and even with the influx of illegal sort of people from FLAG yeah. coming in, we're not really growing. It's the same people week in, week out. Okay. So did you ever... I'm just curious, you know, during all this time, did you ever stop and think about that? Or? No. <laughs> okay. No, I didn't. I, I was pretty much solely ready to do the next step. I was very micromanaged in my head from the phone calls and whatever. Right. I couldn't. I couldn't step out. I couldn't keep up with the daily mass of when the mail pack came to the organization to read all the information, then to read about the International Association of Scientologists, then to read about all the, the new releases and to read about where my book sales should be. And then I was running like 16 different programs. I didn't count the public. It wasn't my job. Right. So you were basically in this rat race. I was like, if I didn't get this done, I was dead. Right. And now, now let's talk about that for a second. What kind of pressure was being brought to bear on you? Like you give me these phone calls and people are yelling and screaming. Were there consequences for not getting things done? Oh, or, sure. Yeah, I, like, I could have been. There's a whole justice system in Scientology. And okay. when you yourself don't have an ability to keep your own ethics in, in terms of your own survival and doing the best you can do, yeah. the group will take justice on you. Uh -huh. And there's steps. It's really interesting. There's supposed to be 40 steps. <laughs> right. From a very, very, very minor infraction to the expulsion of Scientology, step number 40. You're expelled. Yeah. So you would get things like, in the middle steps, you'd get, we're going to give you a committee of evidence. That's when you sit in front of your peers and they... They sort of judge you. They sort of judge you for what you failed to do or get done. Right. Per what you were ordered to do. Did you ever get one of those? Uh, later on, okay. I got something, but... But during this time period? No, because I was, I was never scared of the Sea Org people. Okay. I would just chew their ass, and I would fight with them. Really? But I would also get products. Like, like I started finding myself doing bad stuff that I wouldn't do. Like, people would get all of their targets done, and I would give them some kind of prize. Yeah. You know, I'd buy it out of my own money because the org wouldn't buy it, and it would be something silly, frivolous, like a from the dollar store. Yeah. Well, they also had a bin full of dog food. Okay. And I would buy this shit called Henny Pin Dog Food. It would say it right on it. Yeah. And I would take it and give that to the person in the middle of a huge staff meeting that didn't get enough of their targets done. I would actually make an example of them. By giving them dog food? Yeah. And you came up with that idea all I did. Own? Yeah. Wow. And then on top of that, there was these compliance reports that I would have to write for every person's target. Yes. Not their programs for a target they got done and send to the East U.S. organization there. Yeah. And I would have to do that on top of it. And so one day they wouldn't believe that I was doing this Henny Pen dog food. So I took a candy of it and I smeared it all over one of those and I sent it up blind. Wow. Yeah, so wow. they were like, well, we got that, that you shouldn't have done that, but now we realize, yeah, you actually did that. And I was actually acknowledged by someone, I can't remember who it was, that that was like, yeah, you really, you know, you, you made an example of that person. You kicked their ass, and now people are going to actually follow you. So you were, you were validated. Oh, yeah, I was for validated that. for being a dick. Right. Hey everyone, I have very good news. What I'm announcing here is the culmination of two years of work on my part to expose Scientology and give you the actual facts about what really goes on behind its closed doors. I've completed and published what I believe to be the definitive guide to Dianetics and Scientology, titled Scientology A to Zenu, An Insider's Guide to What Scientology is All About. Why should you get this and read it? 
Well, if you want to understand how people are lured into destructive cults like this and why they stay, this book gives you those answers. If you want to know what Scientologists really believe and why they're willing to cash in their children's college funds, take out second and third mortgages, and even forsake family and friends, this book gives you those answers. If you want to understand why Scientology has amassed so much money and power, and why it seems that the police and the courts are powerless to stop them, those answers are in here as well. Was L. Ron Hubbard serious about Dianetics and Scientology, or was it all just some big con job from the very start? What did he really believe? Why did he start Scientology, and despite all his wealth and power, why did he die alone and afraid? Finally, everyone has heard that Scientology believes in space aliens and some guy named Xenu, and we've all seen South Park. But is that the whole story? Not even close. There's a lot more to know about why Scientologists think they're saving the world, and I break it all down piece by piece. I believe you will not find a simpler and more complete explanation of Scientology's confidential scriptures anywhere else. My own personal story is in here and in more detail than I've ever discussed before. How I grew up in Scientology, why I started working for them, and eventually joined the Sea Organization, and what happened exactly that made me come to my senses and get out. All of that is just chapter one. For anyone who seriously wants to understand Scientology, you cannot do it without this book. It comes with a complete glossary of terms and an organizing chart so you can see the Scientology hierarchy and how it all works. It comes in paperback and as an ebook. I'm currently recording it as an audiobook as well. Buy it at the CreateSpace eStore or on Amazon today. I've put links to both in the description below. To all my fans and subscribers, thank you so much for your support over these past two years. You have made this possible. Believe me when I tell you, this is just the beginning. Stay tuned because a lot more is coming in this new year. Thank you for watching.